Shall we open our Bibles to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 5? We are going into a whole different section. Let me read to you verses 1 through 7, and then I'll bring you up to date. And let me just, I have to say this, you're going to be hearing about people giving up their homes, giving up their homes to pay taxes, so on. And that was the problem. Selfishness was a major, major problem. And Nehemiah comes onto the scene, and he begins to deal with the nobles. The nobles, you remember in chapter 1, were the ones that did not put their neck to the work. They would not embrace the work. They would not be involved in the work. They didn't want anything to do with the work. The work we're talking about, if you just joined us, is building the walls around Jerusalem. They were built in 52 days. So Nehemiah was able to rally all the people except these nobles. And there is a principle I want to teach you today, that the people that reject the work of God will often reject you. If they can say no to God, then they're going to say no to you every single time. If they're going to hurt God, they're going to really majorly take advantage of you. So it is so imperative that you would find people that love God. And if you have someone who's a friend that doesn't love God, he's not a friend. Unless that person fears God, he's never going to be loyal to you in the very end. And loyalty means I speak the truth and lie not. But he starts off, Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1. There was a great cry of the people of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. For there were that said, we are sons and daughters are many. Therefore, we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also that, were, that said, we have mortgaged our land, our vineyards, houses, that we might buy corn because of the dearth or the famine. There were also that said, we have borrowed money from the king's tribute, and that upon our lands and also vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. Then I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, Ye exact usury every one of his brothers. And I set a great assembly against them. Father, I pray today that you would so speak to our hearts and that you would show us what selfishness really is and the damage done in Jesus' name. Amen. The Jewish person has now gone from agriculture into business. And you need to understand this because it will help you. When the Jews were in the land before, they were into agriculture. They were very successful. They could do all kinds of crazy things. And we see that in the nation of Israel in 1948. They took a swamp land that no one else wanted. They planted sycamore trees because they knew that sycamore trees were the trees that would suck up the most water. And they changed that swamp into the most fertile land in the country. So they have never lost that ability. But when they were taken over by Nebuchadnezzar in 586, they were taken into captivity. And you remember, they were taken for 70 years into captivity. And we know that because the Bible tells us that for 490 years, the people of God did not honor God. And here's what God said. When you have a piece of land, every seventh year, you have to let the land rest. On the sixth year, I'll give you double portion. So I'm going to give you twice as much as you usually make. And that will sustain you over the next year. So instead of taking 365 days or 360 days back then with the Babylonian calendar free, do anything you want, travel, they said to themselves, why don't we make more money? And so they planted another year, and they went every year for 490 years without a break. God then decided to take up his account. He divided seven into 490, and it comes out 70 years. Well, the point is, is that whatsoever man soweth, that is what he's going to reap. Just because God doesn't bring judgment that day or even the next year does not mean you got away with it and we're making money. God keeps an account, and God knows exactly what's taken place. So when it came time for them to be dealt with, the children of Israel, 
the southern kingdom. It was Nebuchadnezzar that took them back into Babylon, 900 miles away, and had them in captivity for 70 years. In that captivity, the Jewish mind changed. It went from agriculture into business. So now, today, the number one thing in a Jewish mind is business. And you really can't beat him when it comes to that. But the point being is that something happened. When agriculture, there is a giving society. I have this, I'm going to give it to you. I have cows, I'll give it to you. I have this, I have that, no big thing because I have so much. In a business society, money it becomes different. I'm not going to give up a buck, not 50 cents, because 50 cents will make a buck. And all of a sudden, it changes the whole person. And so what's happening now is they become a very greedy society. So this is what happens in chapter 5. In chapter 4, it was the enemy, Tobiah and Sanballat. They destroyed everything. But in chapter 5, Tobiah and Sanballat are not around. And not only that, but no one's around. You know who's around? Themselves. It was their own selfishness that destroyed themselves. And so the Bible says the land stayed. There was no work being done in chapter 5 because we had to deal with problems. And what I want to teach you today is if you're a mom or a dad, then you're over people. If you're a businessman or a CEO, you're over people. If you're a pastor, whatever your position is, even uh, whatever it might be, you're over people. And the question is how are you handling that situation? And the thing that became so angry that he became so mad is because the people took advantage of each other. And it happens. And that is a tragic thing. It's not the world that's hurting the church. It's the people inside the church that are going after each other. It's the lack of fellowship, the lack of unity. It's taking advantage, causing splits, causing division. The world never comes in and causes a problem. It's those of us who are not spiritually minded or business minds that are unwilling to be disciplined in the realm of the spirit. And all of a sudden we begin to say, I don't like that, I don't like this, and so on. Or it's a bunch of people unwilling to make a sacrifice. Or a bunch of people that are unwilling to be a body. They're not willing to be. Kind of like the same thing, the nobles. You know, we don't want to put our neck to it. We're not responsible. Well, first of all, you are responsible. This is your building. This is your church. Just like the nobles, we don't want to do it. We're not going to put our neck to the work. It doesn't make a difference why. It's like we're not going to be part of it. They could go down and cook. They can go down and be part of it. They can be something. But to go against what God's doing is terrible. And you have to remember this. Because God gives you that picture. Because later on, now they're going to take advantage of you. And what gets me so upset is how gullible we become. We take a person that gives us a business card, and it has that little igloo on the bottom of it. So it's like all of a sudden, you know, this is a Christian witness. And so we hire them. We want them to pay the bill or, you know, paint the house. But we personally don't check up on them. And all of a sudden, they've never painted the house before. They just lied. And because they're a Christian, you're going to think they're going to tell you the truth. Well, why would you do that? Why would you just throw your brains out? You're not going to have anyone paint your house until you see what they've done. You're not going to let anybody work on your car until you know they can do it. Well, I just make a difference. I just looked in the yellow pages and said, this guy can rebuild my engine. So I went down there, and he didn't know what he was doing. It cost me 1200 bucks. You hear that all the time. Did you check into it? No. Then why are you mad at him? Why don't you get mad at yourself because you're a poor steward? Well, I didn't have time. Well, why do you have time to pay extra money. You see, there comes a responsibility in every one of your lives that you have to make sure that the teachers you have for your kids and where you send your kids and what you do with your life and how you spend your life and what you do in your home all is responsible in your lap. You are a steward of what God is doing in your life. And just to be able to say, well, he said he's a Christian, I'm going to trust him, doesn't make a thing. More Christians have ripped off business people than any others because they feel like they're special. And I think just the opposite. If you're a Christian and you work for a non-believer, you ought to be the very best. You ought to bring substance into that work. You ought to be able to do it that if no one sees you, you do it for the glory of God. Whatever you do in word or deed, you do for the glory of God. That's how it should be, you know. But it's not. You know, Christians are stealing. Christians are cheating. What do you mean we're cheating? Because you took more than an hour. And you're only supposed to have, you know, one hour. You want an hour and ten minutes. You ripped off the boss. You're never going to get promotion that way. And mostly because you've ripped off God. God watches that stuff. So promotion comes not from the east or from the west. It comes from the Lord. So if you're cheating your boss, you're cheating God. 
That's how you are. Why would God say that? Because you are to be a witness of the glory of God wherever you go, whatever you do. So you're above reproach. You're living above it. You don't talk about people. You go and talk to them. You don't yell at people. You begin to minister to people. You're different people. And so what happened, the same thing here, is the selfishness destroyed the work of God. You remember Jonah? Just give you a little bit of insight. Jonah, you know the story. I've told you so many times. But he didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. And first of all, why did God ask him? Because God knew that Jonah had a problem. He was prejudiced. He would not go down to Nineveh. He hated the Assyrian people. And because of that, he couldn't be a prophet of God. You just can't have what you want. So God came to him one day and said, I want you to go down to Nineveh. And (laughs) Nehemiah said, no, I won't do it. And what do you mean you won't do it? I'm God. No, I'm not going to do it. I hate the Assyrians. And the problem with you, God, is if I go down there and preach, they're all going to get saved, and all these Assyrians are going to be in heaven. And when I get to heaven, they're all going to beat me up there because I brought these Assyrians with me. That's your problem because you're a God of mercy. So what did Jonah do? He, didn't, he kept his conviction. He went down to Tarshish. He went down to the boats. He went down to the bottom of the boats. He went down to the bottom of the ocean. And this is what happened. All of a sudden, the waves begin to come. And the Bible says, and the waves came, and the winds blew, and the ship went all over the place. But guess who was sleeping at the bottom of the ship? Jonah. So the people on top had no idea. All they knew, they were thrown up. These were professional fishermen, the best on the planet, and they couldn't handle the waves. And so they threw all their property over. And when that didn't do it, they threw all their food over, trying to sacrifice everything they could to make the boat light so it wouldn't sink. That didn't work. They finally went downstairs. They woke this guy up, and they said, hey, what's your name? Oh, my name is Jonah. What are you doing down here? I am a rebellious prophet running from God. Oh, thanks a lot. Man, why didn't you tell us before you got on our boat? We are thrown up upstairs. We lost everything we had. We lost everything we have because of you. You have brought this into our life. Now take it into your home. One rebellious dad can send a home upside down. One rebellious woman can send the house upside down, screaming, shouting. All of a sudden, one rebellious kid can cause all kinds of problems and police and everything else to come out of your home. You see, it doesn't take a bunch. It just takes one selfish individual to cause problems in our life. One selfish man can cause a whole platoon to be lost. One selfish pastor can absolutely destroy a church because he has to have a little bit of sex over here because he doesn't have the heart to say once again that I need help. And that's the danger. And all of a sudden, the selfishness brings the waves and brings the storms and brings all these things, and yet we're so into ourselves we can't see it. But everyone around us feels it. We come to church, all kinds of explosions. We go home, all kinds of explosions. And finally, they said, listen, if you throw me over into the ocean, everything will stop. And so they took him up. And mom and dad just threw this guy over, you know. And when he hit the water, the Bible says, and the wind stopped. And the sea stopped. Everything stopped. Why? Because God got what he wanted. And he was on his way back to Nineveh because God was going to make him do what he said. And when all of a sudden he walked down Nineveh, he says, you're all going to hell. Six words in the Hebrew. That's how long his sermon was. Is that a selfish pastor? You're all going to hell in a handbasket. That's it. He climbs this hill, and all of a sudden 600,000 men accept Christ. Not only that, women, everyone, they, they estimate 1.3 million people came to Christ because of Jonah. Not because of what he said, but because they heeded his warning. So guess what? When Jonah and God got together on the side of the hill, he said, thanks a lot, God. I appreciate this. this I told you. Now there are 1.3 million Assyrians up in heaven. Thanks a lot. I don't want to go to heaven no more. You see, that's the danger of being selfish. Now, I want you to take that thought into this chapter, and I'm going to show you. It's a very damaging thing that happens in our life. And don't kid yourself, we all are selfish. It means you have so much conceit, that's all you see is yourself. Everything has to be done around you. If it's not your way, you get bummed out. And these are the things you have to understand. Now, as a leader, how do you deal with that? As a pastor or a CEO, how do you deal with that at work? Because if you don't deal with it, it's going to destroy everything. And it will destroy. And so people say, well, I hope he moves on. hope this happens. Listen, everyone's looking to you. How are you going to handle it? Everyone's looking to dad. How are we going to handle this at work? Or how are we going to handle this at home? You have to deal with it. It's not going to go away. And so here, Nehemiah begins to teach me how to deal with it. And so the history, as I told you, that they were now into business. And so they had a business mind rather than an agriculture mind. So chapter 5 is the beginning of the first strike in the Bible. 
and it was by the poor people. And when the poor people begin to rise up, that is going to make a statement. In fact, if you could get 300 million people down to the White House, you could solve every problem right now. It's just a matter of people saying enough's enough. I'm not going to deal with it no more. See, we don't have that. We just kind of put up with everything. And so it's not because the enemy, the work stopped. And it's not because of they're tired or exhausted, the work stopped. It was because of selfishness that the work of God stopped. Miriam, when she came after her brother, she was smitten with leprosy. And you remember what happened? Moses had to pray for her. And then the work of God could not move on for seven days. Because of her action, she was dealt with. No one else could move on. So you ask me, what is the number one thing in life, cause and effect? If I make this decision, what's going to happen? If I make this attitude, what's going to happen? If I say it this way to my kids, what's going to happen? If I just say what I want to say, what's going to happen? You have to think it through. And this is going to tell you how you deal with this type of a situation. And so Ananias, another one, again, him and his wife were killed because they false pretense, the greed. We want the honor. We want to give everything, but we didn't give everything. Gehazi, same thing. He had to have all the goods. He was selfish. And Elijah said, where have you been? He says, I've been here and there. Elijah said, I was with you when you took all the stuff. Now let me give you what you didn't get, leprosy. So all the way through the Bible, it talks about those who give and those who take. And you have to be careful because if they take from God, they're going to take from you. If they have no fear in their heart, they're not a friend. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. You want friends around you that fear God. And when they do not fear God, that's the end of it. They can be a brother. They can be a sister. They can be a ministry. They cannot be a friend. My friends have to fear God, and I have to fear God. Otherwise, I'm going to take. So we pick up, number one, he rebukes them in verses 1 through 5. And in verse 1, there's a great darkness that fills the time. It says in verse 1, there was a great cry of the people. Now notice this. And of their wives against their brethren. Now that gets bad. When women begin to rebel, that means the moral fabric is coming undone. So the women now are speaking up. They're saying, listen, this is wrong. We can't feed our families. We can't do anything. And it's the Jews. It's these guys, these nobles. They have hurt us. They've taken advantage of us. Nehemiah, this is not right. And this is right. And all of a sudden, there was a great cry of the people and their wives against the brothers. And so they could not help themselves. They had to turn to somebody. They went to Nehemiah. That's the first lesson. If you can't solve a problem, let's get to you to Nehemiah. Get to a leader. Get to somebody you respect. And they're going to take it to somebody else. And then in verses 2 through 5, four types of people. First of all, in verse 2, the number one, here are those who did not own land. For there were they that are sons and daughters are many. Therefore, we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. They didn't have jobs. They didn't own houses. They were just the common folk. And not tell you what, that's what's happening now. People can't make it. They're working two jobs. They can't be able to do anything. And now things are getting worse. What are we going to do? And it's not about owning a house or owning this or that. And the attitude is we don't need them. Let's get rid of them. Well, that's the attitude of Satan. That's not the attitude of God. And so Jesus says you're always going to have them. You have to love people and get away from the status. Get away from judging people. You have what you have because God gave it to you. And you own what you own because God has been gracious to you. But how dare you look down at anybody else? And when you go under underpass and you see some wino there, just remember that could be you. So I'd have you, rather than criticize them in front of your children, just say to your kids, hey, let's pray for him right now as you're driving. And just say, God, take care of him. Because he probably was a vice president one time and just lost it. Or he's probably some successful businessman and the pressure just broke him. Or maybe he went through some divorce. You don't know. You have no idea. But as Christians, you don't have a right to pass judgment. What you do have a right is to pray for people. And you can turn that criticism into intercessory prayer. And that is the key. If you do that, you think God's going to bless you? And by the way, if you're driving underneath the freeway and you begin to act like that, oh, look at that bum over there. I can't believe the bum. I wish he'd go someplace. What are your kids thinking? And what does God think? Now, both the same situation. You go through, oh, God, help that man find what he really needs in Jesus Christ. Now the kids hear that. And now you, how does God feel about that? Which way do you want God to see you? Which way do you want your children to grow up? 
How you speak to them, how you teach them, how you act is so important in life. And so the first group, they had nothing, basically. The second group is found in verse 3. They were landowners. They had a house. They owned an apartment, whatever it might be. They mortgaged their property to buy food. It says here, some also, in verse 3, said that we have mortgaged our lands, our vineyards, and our houses that we might buy corn because of the famine. So there was a judgment upon the city, upon that area, and it was getting hard. So again, people had to give up things, and so your house goes upside down. All of a sudden, things are happening. And so some guy comes and says, hey, I can loan you some money. Well, how much is it? Well, we'll talk about that later on, but it's going to be a percentage, 12%, something like that. And so you do it because that's all the money you have because you're hungry. Well, think, think about that. Number three, the third group, those who borrowed money, verse 4, in order to pay their taxes from the Persian king, Xerxes, this is what they did in verse 4, there were also they that said we borrowed money from the king's tribute and that upon our lands and vineyards. And this is such an important thing for me to remember because you remember what Xerxes says? Nehemiah, go build it. Go for it. And by the way, here's two letters, and I'll pay for it. So Nehemiah is walking out. What should have Nehemiah done? King, do we have to pay you back, or is this a gift? But Nehemiah took off. Now, isn't it interesting when you look at this whole thing now that all of a sudden, because of the walls going up, the money it's taken to pay for this, now the taxes go up. And so all of a sudden, what does that teach you? Nothing's for free, Christians. Nothing's for free. Oh, I got it for free. Nothing's for free. Can you just say that with me? Nothing's for free except Jesus Christ. Period. That's it. It's all a gimmick. God, you know, what? You know, <laughs> it's just crazy how we get into things, you know. We get sucked in because why? I can be a millionaire overnight. Really? You know, I told Chuck, I was coming down with Chuck one day, and he says, I got a new life insurance, and yeah, he was 75 then, and we were coming down. He says, it's only $20 a month for a million dollars. I said, could you add $2 million to that, and I'll give you $40 a month? He says, you're terrible. I said, I was just thinking about it. You know, what do you think? <laughs> but that's how you think. Who cares about you dying? Here, let me get the $2 million. Nothing's for free. Someone has to die. So what I'm trying to say is that we're so gullible. You have to understand there's always a gimmick. And then number four, he says here, the fourth person in verse 5 are those who made the money. It says here, the wealthy Jews exploited. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. See, they lost their children. The children are now living with the wealthy people. We being into bondage, our sons and daughters into servants. And some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in our power, because they have no land, no money, to redeem them. For other men have our land and vineyards. We have been robbed. Nehemiah, we're uptight. We are absolutely furious. And here are the nobles. They didn't want to work. And now they've taken all of our money. Now, hey, stop. If they didn't want to work, why would you trust them? And that's where we become gullible. Just because they say they're Christian doesn't mean they're Christian. Just because a guy wants to take you out doesn't mean he doesn't want to go to bed with you. In fact, every guy, you ought to think that. Yeah, right off the bat, think, you know something? I'm going out with this guy. It'd be not natural if he didn't. But even a Christian would be not natural. I'm looking for a spiritual man. If he even comes towards me, I'm going to smack him over the face of the Bible. You have my privilege to do it. He ought not even kiss you on the first day. Stop. Why does he want your lips so quick? Get his heart before you get his lips. You say, well, why? Because you know there's more nerves in your lips to turn you on than anything else in the human body. You just touch his lips. That's all it's going to take. Oh, he's the one. Why? Because he can kiss you. But will he provide for you? Will he be there when you're crippled? Those are the questions you have to ask. So here it is. All of a sudden, we begin to realize, and the work halted, not because of anybody else, but because of their sin. And the work of God takes forever because people don't want to get involved. People don't want to get involved with the project behind it. Well, we don't have to have it. We don't need it. Well, okay, fine. But that's not the truth. The truth is we have to finish it. And this study isn't about that, but the same thing. If all of us would take a responsibility, it'd be done years ago. But because not, we do what we can. It's all the way across the board. But that tells me, hey, I don't have to give my neck to it. Well, no. But you have to give your neck to God. Can you come and not do anything? Can you just come and receive? And that's it? That's not a body. That's not a family. 
That's people who are taken advantage. That's not what we want. We want born-again, spirit-filled Christians who love God with all their heart. And despite all that, like Nehemiah, we'll build. I mean, because I have to. But the point is, is that you better be careful. God's showing you. And all of a sudden, you see a trademark of a person, and all of a sudden, you make them a friend. Why did you make them a friend? Because of money? Because of what they can do for you? Just remember, if they do not fear God, they don't care about you. Because if they fear God, they're going to fear what they do to you. Secondly, so important, so important, he responds to them. And this is what I want to teach you. This is how I want you to pray about responding from this point on. When your children go crazy, when a CEO goes crazy, when you have to deal with people at work, whatever it might be, just listen to what I want to say. You have been dealt with this situation. How are you going to deal with this selfish situation? Here's how he did it. Verse 6. He said he controlled his anger. Do you have anger problems? I'm not going to ask you. Never mind. He controlled his anger. So he didn't say anything. He didn't say, he didn't cuss, he didn't get mad, he didn't scream, he didn't yell, he didn't point fingers, he just controlled his anger. Can you do that? Can you hold back? And all of a sudden it says here in verse 6, I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. He was angry because of the nobles, because of their sin, how they took advantage of the people of God. They were not living the Word of God. They were taking advantage of their own believers, and they put their Jews in an awkward situation. God had redeemed them. Now they were putting them back in bondage. And it just irked Nehemiah. He, just, he had it with these people. And all of a sudden we find the danger. In verse 6, they did not know God's Word, the nobles. Verse 7, they did not live God's Word. In verse 8, they did not trust God's Word. Now, you know why I know that? Because they didn't give the neck to the Word. They would not commit to anything. And you better commit to God and what He wants you to do. Secondly, in verse 7, not only did He control His anger, this is what I want to share with you gals and guys. If you're mad at your kid, you got to back up. If you're mad at your boss, you got to back up. If you're mad at your husband, you got to back up. Why? Give me one good reason, because what you're going to say is not going to be accurate. Here, he consulted with himself. What do you mean, Steve? I mean, you have to back up and hold your tongue. You have to now ponder everything. And what this means is now you're at a point you can listen. Sometimes I just want to react and just go crazy. But if I can step back, I'll listen. And I don't know if you know this, but it takes two. It's all, not the same kid always in your home. I know you think it is, but there are some kids here that are now 40 years old. They're messed up because they always got the blame for what they didn't do. Because mom wouldn't spend the time of setting down and getting all the kids together and say, let's hear the whole story. And eventually you can have discernment what to do. Because a boss hears it from everybody else. He doesn't ask the employee what's going on. He makes a decision, and it's a bad decision. Every single decision we make in life is terrible if we assume. You ought to hate that word assumption. It's the lowest form of communication. It means I assume. I thought. I thought I had all the information. Now just take for a second. Did you talk to the person that you're mad at? No. Why should I? Why shouldn't you? Give me one. You're dingling. You're not going to give the guy a chance to talk and hear his side? How can you make an honest decision before God if you don't sit there and listen to what this guy says? I don't care if he does the same thing 100,000 times. On this one situation, if you violate that, you're not going to make a good decision in your life. You have to hear it. Because this one time, he might be telling you the truth. And maybe, like Daniel, you have a bunch of people trying to get you out of the ministry. And so they're going to lie to a king, Darius, and say, hey, anyone that prays to you, Darius, anybody else, we're not going to, we'll have to kill them. And so they had to find something to get rid of Daniel. So they lied when Daniel was telling the truth the whole time. So you got to be careful. So if I can back up and cool off, I'm going to listen. So here's the question. Are you a great listener when you're really ticked off? Or do people see it? Do you throw things and do you walk around with anger? Do you slam cabinets? Or can you hear anything? Can you hear the Spirit? No, because you're in the flesh. you got to get out of the flesh and get back into the Spirit. The only way I know how to tell you is you have to listen. If you can listen, you're walking in the Spirit. You don't have to like the person. You don't have to love him. You have to listen. And you have to put two and two together, and then when you come together like Moses, I'm going to put him in jail. The next day, he found out that the guy needed to die. Moses said, kill him. Now I know the mind of the Lord. Until you talk to that person, you don't know the mind of God. You don't. You might think you do, and you might even argue with me, but I don't care. You can tell anything you want, but I tell you this. If you have two people, it takes two people to do this thing, you better make sure you're not being set up. If you're going to be a great 
administrator, a great business guy, a great pastor, a great leader, a great mom and dad. You have to listen to the other side. You have to. And so here he consulted. Then I consulted with myself. I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said, you exact money. And the word consult here means to give oneself advice. It means you're going to talk to yourself. It also means to analyze or to evaluate the situation. Look at who is going to profit from this beating of this kid or who's going to get close to you because you kicked that person out or who's trying to climb that ladder with any way he can. All of a sudden you pull away, you see all that. And now you can make a good decision because you listen. And by the way, when you pull away and listen, you can hear God. And that's who you want to hear more than anybody else. Then number three, in verse eight, he confronted the number, number nobles. He confronted the nobles. It says in verse 8, I said unto them, Ye are after our ability have redeemed our brethren, the Jews which were sold unto the heathens. And will ye even sell your brothers? In other words, you, I can't believe you did this. God delivered us out of Egypt. He delivered our lives out of the heathens. Now you're acting like a heathen. Why could you ever Take your authority and hurt these people. These are your brothers and sisters. You see, you've lost all responsibility. And then in verse 9, also he said, it's not good that you do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of God? And that's the key this morning. Do you have the fear of God? If you do, you're going to listen. If you do, you're not going to react. If you do, you're going to get to the issue. You're going to deal with it because it will never go away. Some of you say it's going to go away. It won't go away. Some would say, well, we don't have to deal with that. The kids, you do have to deal with it. If you don't deal with it, they're going to grow up and have problems in life. If you don't deal with it in the church, they're going to cause other problems because others are watching how you're going to deal with it. You have to deal with every situation in life. You can't sweep it under a counter. You can't. And when you try to do that, what you're really telling me is you want leadership, but you don't want the responsibility of being tough. Or you want leadership and you want the name, but you don't want to have you don't want to do that because either you want everyone to like you. It's not about people liking you. It's about God liking you. I don't know why we can't get this through our head. It's I, I want to be loved by everybody. People are not going to love you. They're going to love you more for being honest and loving God than they are for just letting you pass. Iron sharpeneth iron. You have to understand this. And what happens today is we don't want to hurt anybody. What do you mean you don't want to hurt anybody? They're hurting everybody. Wouldn't it be nice for someone just to set them down and have a good talk with them? If you're not angry, you can have a great talk with them. And no matter what they say, can't get you angry. You don't have to get puffed up. You don't get w weird about it. God might be using you as an instrument to help them. So it doesn't solve any problem getting in the flesh. It's better to speak the Word of God and let people make a decision. Are they going to be obedient or not? And so my whole heart is to try to get the best staff for you. If we don't have it, we're going to have to move and make some decisions. But we can move people. We can do this. We can do that. We can do everything we can to save people. But the bottom line is that if they don't want to sacrifice and serve God, we don't want them. That's the heart because they're ministering here for you. And then verses 10 through 13, kind of cool, just four things. Number one in verse 10, stop doing what's wrong. He says, I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn. I pray you let us leave off the usury. So let me explain. It was okay to give money. It was not okay to charge interest. So what was happening is they did two things, the nobles. They charged interest and they made slaves. They don't have the heart of God. They do not fear God. And that's my premise of this whole thing. Your friends, oftentimes, who hurt you the most, it's your own fault. I know you're going to get mad at me, but I'm going to say it. Because you did not use wisdom. You saw them not fear God. You saw how they act. You saw where they went. You saw what movies they went to. You saw how they treated people. You saw how they talked about people's back. And yet you wanted a friend and you made a friend. You made a friend with the enemy, not with the fear of God. If you could just simply put the fear of God in your life, you would not treat your husband that way. You would not treat your spouse that way. You'd not treat your children that way. What makes the difference, Steve? It's when you can honestly say, I fear God. And when I am so mad at this person, they still have Jesus Christ in their heart. And Jesus said to Paul, why are you kicking against the prick? I am in that man's heart. And I'm in people's hearts. Be careful. And so, number one, if you know it's wrong, let it go. If you know 
pizza is killing you at night, don't do it. Steve, no, you. If you know you get hungry at night, put an apple out there, but that's all you can get. Uh, put lo- guidelines. You know to be, it's bad. You know this boyfriend you're going with is going to take you to bed. You haven't gone there yet. Well, why are you, what are you doing? Well, I just think I could get him saved. Saved? All you're thinking about is bed. If you think about heaven, you dump him in a heartbeat. You see? I, you think about, do you know what it's like to go from virgin to filthiness? It's not a good thing. And all of a sudden now, when you are a virgin, you break that and you walk down the aisle, not in a white robe anymore. You do, but it's not white. So if you know to not do it, don't do it. That's what he's saying here. Verse 11, start doing what is right. Check it out. Restore, I pray you, to them even this day, their land, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their house, also a hundredth part, that's about 12%, of the money and of the corn, of the wine, of the oil that you extracted from them. Give them back. Okay, I know what I should do. I'm going to go tell my wife I'm sorry. I'm going to tell my son I'm sorry. I'm going to sit down a day and say I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Then do it. Well, you know, they're not going to receive it, so forget it. No, you do it. If you know to do right or you know you haven't done it, let me really twist your arm a second. If you know you haven't given the way you should, make it right. That's all there is to it. So, in other words, if you offended somebody, go make it right. You can do that. You know what's wrong. You know what's right. Then, number 12, verse 12, share your conviction. Then said they, we will restore them and will require nothing of them. That's nice. I'm not, we'll give it all back. So will we do as thou sayest. Then I called, check this out, this is so much wisdom. Then I called the priest and took an oath of them. I don't trust you guys. I love you, but I don't have that little fish on my little card. I'm Nehemiah. Go get me the priest. <laughs> You're going to do this in front of everybody. You offended everybody. You ripped everybody off. But just to hold you accountable, help you, and help them, we want to bring healing in our life. And so if you have a contract, get a contract. Because black and white don't lie. You know how they say liars can figure, but figures don't lie. So we have contracts when we do business with people. Why? Because we don't want people to get hurt. We go back to the contract and see what it says. Well, you're right. We have to pay you. It just solves all the problems. So it's not that you don't trust people, but it keeps what you said honest. And here, very simply, listen, this is your conviction. I'm going to bring the priest. And now we're going to do it public. And so it has a little bit more punch to it. I, I sinned openly, and now I need to get it right openly. Peter had to confess openly. And lastly, verse 13, stand firm in your conviction. Also, I shook my lap. In other words, I just shook it off. I shook all this dirt off my lap. And said, so God shake out every man from his house and from the laborers. And he that performeth not this promise. If you're going to lie right now, then God's going to shake you out of his kingdom. Thus be he shaken out emptied, and all the congregation said amen. Right here, I want to stop you. All these poor people, everyone I've been talking about, yeah, pastor, gets, go for it, go for it. At this moment, you have to be forgiving. If they have hurt you, you have to forgive them. And I've seen this happen so often. The guy who has the money realizes what he does, he gets forgiven, but the people who've lost, they never forgive. And so you don't produce any more in your life. It takes both ways here. And so here he says, once again, and all the congregation said, amen, so be it. And praise the Lord. And the people did according to his promise. And so quickly, what's he saying? He's saying that you're going to have problems in your life. These problems are always going to be there. So don't look at it as like, I can't believe this has happened to me. Why not? There's always going to be problems. Someone is always going to be selfish. Someone's always going to put themselves above something. Or always desire what they want. You're going to have to deal with it. Your kids, your wife, your husband, business. How do I deal with that? Well, you're going to get angry. I am. Well, you have to back away. You have to hear from God. And then you have to listen to the person you're angry with. Listen. Because in that listening, you're going to hear the Holy Spirit. And God is going to show you yay or nay. And then you can rebuke him head on. And then you can begin to solve the problem for the people. And all of a sudden, he walks you down. What you know is right, do it. What you know is wrong, don't do it. And by the way, how are you going to act here? We're going to make it all right. Okay, I want to bring a pastor in. 
I want to bring another person in. I want to have accountability, okay? And by the way, if you break this, you do it before God. And remember, you're going to stand before God one day and answer for the way you dealt with people. This is a great leader. And these are great nuggets. And here's the key that really I can define it in my life, cause and effect. If I make this statement, what's it going to do? And so I kind of live my life around that. When I could, I, and I don't want to shock the people. I want to warn the people. So we're not going to all of a sudden you know, change the name of our church. We'd never do that. I'm not even thinking that way. But I would go through a process with you and tell you why everything else. That's a terrible decision probably. But I would tell you. But I just, some guys just get up and say, okay, no, we're no longer Calvary Chapel. We're now the Steve Mays ministry. <laughs> you know, whatever. No, we're not. See, we're a family. That means we do things together as a family. We're going to die together. We're going to bleed together. We're going to eat together. But if you don't want to work together, you're not part. That makes you a family. Because we might have battles. But here's the thing. If we're going to fight, let's all fight against Satan, not against each other. Father, I pray that, Lord, you would teach us, especially those who, God, you have blessed not to be stingy, not to be so worried about what they're going to make and how much more they're going to make, but to be gracious. Because you always give to the gracious person. And help those who have been hurt by churches and other things not to hold on to bitterness. They cannot get out of ministry just because of that. They need to get back into the work of God. And they can't just forget marriage. They have to get back. No matter what's happened in their life, People are looking at them. Help us to be willing to listen. And if we're so angry we can't listen, it's not from God. So, Lord, would you control our anger? And would you help us to consult ourselves and make sure we are in your spirit? In Jesus' name, amen.